Inc. from downtown, from Councillor Benton's district. Uh, and we want to welcome you as well, because this uh, could have an impact on that uh, stretch of roadway as well. You know, we're here today because uh, for what, since I've been a city councilor and lived in this neighborhood, uh, we've been looking at strategies to try to address the increase in speeding. Um, and that started with a traffic study that was done by our city council office way back. Uh, Sean from my office is going to help me a little bit, I think, four or five years ago uh, when we did our very first report. We found a problem and began looking for solutions. Um, and in the meantime, we know that APD is not up to staffing levels, uh, even though we've funded, fully funded uh, APD uh, every year since I've been a city councilor. They've struggled to maintain staffing and have returned funds every year back uh, that were unspent. So, you know, we looked for other solutions. Uh, count, uh, now, say, uh, Senator Antoinette Cidio Lopez and uh, our state representative, Gail Chasey, and I started looking at some other solutions and found some technology solutions that might help. Some of us remember the old uh, street signs and speed signs that said, well, the, the lights are timed to 30 miles an hour. Um, some of us know that for a while that wasn't the case. And last year we returned some of those uh, lights back to the 30 mile an hour limit. But some of you know and have experienced myself seeing firsthand too, um, those lights also work at 60 miles an hour. Um, and so we still see some of those issues. And quite frankly, um, there is a, a correlation between speed and crashes in the lead and cold corridor. So we went to look for some other alternatives because we, if we can't have a police officer there 24 seven at every intersection, we wanted something different. And one of those is are the rest on red or uh, red unless you're speed, uh, driving the speed limit uh, lights uh, that we started to evaluate from other cities. And we asked a local farm, Lee Engineering, to take a look at how they were used the real traffic data for what speeding, uh, capture some speed data, capture crash data, and help us determine where those types of lights might best be used. Um, and then gratefully, uh, Senator Cedillo Lopez and Representative Chasey uh, teamed up with us to, to allocate some state capital outlay funds along with some funds that I could bring in from our city bond funds that you approve as our voters. Um, to help do a pilot project to get this going. So tonight's meeting is to help introduce this to the neighborhood to tell everybody how this might work, let the engineers explain how they determined um, that it might be helpful and uh, it likely could be helpful. And then we'll talk about next steps for implementing this. But before I do, I want to introduce uh, our state senator, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez, who's in the uh, room here. And Senator, if you're able or want to join us with your video or audio, we'd love to, to give you a chance to say hello to the neighborhood. Um, hi, hi, Pat. Hi, Councillor Davis. Ironically, I'm driving <laughs> on um, on coal because uh, I'm driving back from a legislative hearing in Santa Fe. Um, so I'm just really happy to be here. As soon as I get home, I'll get on my computer and uh, and participate more effectively than on my uh, on my phone. But I'm um, I'm pleased that um, that all of the neighbors. I don't know how many if people have signed up, but I'm pleased that the neighborhood is getting to participate and um, and to brainstorm and to to help with this. Because as we all know, the best solutions come from the people who are most affected. Um, so thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for your leadership on trying to find solutions to make the area safer. Uh, thanks, Senator, and don't don't speed. We uh, we know that you live in our neighborhood and uh, you know those roads well. So, uh, thanks so much. And I have to say, we couldn't do this without our legislators who were able to match some of our city funds uh, to put towards this study and uh, ultimately give us some money to to begin implementing these if we choose to do that after this meeting today. I want to also introduce, if uh, I see our state representative, Madam Chairperson uh, Gail Chasey, who's uh, also in the panel. Oh, there she is. She is at home already. And she also lives right on the lead and coal corridor, just like I used to do. Uh, Representative, thanks for your help with this. And I want to give you a chance to speak with the neighbors too. Um, thank you, Pat. And I, I as, as Senator Cedillo Lopez said, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity for the neighbors to have some input here. We've heard a lot from them and we've had a lot of meetings with some of the leaders and uh, some of the policymakers, and trying to find some kind of a solution. And I, I used to travel lead and coal to my office downtown. I ended up moving my law office home during the pandemic, but I, I can't even begin to count the number of accidents I've witnessed or almost was in. And uh, I, <laughs> we have to do something, and it really 
it, it just can't go on any longer without some kind of solution. And I, I think there may need to be um, multiple approaches to it. And uh, I, I do want the, uh, my neighbors to feel that they've been heard too. So thank you so much. Thanks, Representative, and thanks again uh, for chipping in for this. I, I agree. There's multi, there, we know there are a lot of different parts of this moving puzzle, but one of those is being sure that uh, we are using technology, I think, to, to help fill in the gaps when we don't have officers at every corner um, to be sure that if someone's being unsafe, that we don't have to wait on an officer that we can do something. So hopefully this will do that. Uh, let me introduce a couple of other folks in the chat or uh, in our uh, panelists this evening that you're going to hear from or see. Uh, some of you uh, are city council uh, fan followers, which I realize is not many for good reason. Uh, no, Mr. Julian Moya, he's our Zoom moderator, um, and he's gonna be helping us with Q&A at the end of our presentation today. Uh, I think almost all of you know Sean Foran, uh, who's much more popular in our city council district than hey. I am. Sean runs my city council office. Oh, deals good, with all I've got to get on the... Um, the constituent issues and has been really spearheading this effort, uh, along with Tom Minicucci, who's one of our uh, planning staff at the city council. He deals with all of our street issues, roadway issues, and capital issues, and Tom's instrumental in keeping all those departments and, and pieces moving together, and Tom's been working with the engineers at Lee Engineering. So, gentlemen, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, we're going to use your expertise in a little bit when we get to questions, but I want to be sure folks know that you're here. Um, that said, Sean, would you introduce our uh, engineers and they have a presentation about how the red lights work and some of the data they found and then we'll talk to the neighborhoods about their questions and concerns. Sounds good. Um, yep. Um, so up next we have uh, Paul Baraclau and Jonathan Fan with Lee Engineering who's done the engineering study for us to determine the feasibility for the rest and red lights. So Paul has a slideshow. Um, and then after following that, we're going to um, start answering some of the questions that we received ahead of time. Um, folks, also, there is a Q&A option down at your, the bottom of your screen. If you have questions that come up as the presentation is going, feel free to type in some questions. And we can either answer them there or we'll answer them live at some point. If we don't get the some of the questions, we can, we'll uh, make sure we follow up with them uh, with anyone on the list. And if anyone has not uh, put, if anyone did not register for the meeting, if they'd please send me an email, I'll put my email in a chat that everyone can see just so I can make sure I have your email on a list so we, any follow-up gets to you as well. With that, I'll pass it over to Paul. Good evening. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Councilor, Senator, Representative. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to work on this project and present some of the results uh, here to the neighborhoods. Um, let me share my screen. All right. So we had the opportunity to uh, dive into the lead and coal um, corridors and assess the feasibility of looking at a, a technology that's been around but has a, a new twist to it uh, called Arrest in Red. Um, and so we are going to uh, kind of describe how uh, that operates and then look into um, how it's being enhanced. Uh, for this project. So just a quick overview on uh, the organization of the slideshow so everybody can follow along. The, we'll start out with the overview of the operations, uh, document some previous studies, um, and then go into the, the meat of the, the study, which will be the infrastructure and functionality review, uh, the cost estimate and uh, timeline, the data collection that we did, uh, deploy on the corridor. We also looked at the crash rates and then we pulled that all together into a ranking and uh, proceeded with some recommendations, which you'll find here and in the report, which is also online. So the first piece is, is definitely the rest and red concept. And so normally in a signal operation, the signal knows what it's going to do next. It's always going to the next phase. If it's served the left turn, then it's going to go to the through movement. And then most of us are pretty familiar with how the, the rotation of the cycle of the signal proceeds. In this case, there's a, a unique opportunity when the traffic is not at its peak, where the signal, if it's not being asked to do anything else at the moment, it will default to red in all directions. And that does a couple of things for us. One, um, 
it doesn't hang out on the main street. Uh, when it hangs out on the main street, many times that is when uh, the vehicle can see that he's got the green and he may choose to um, kind of drift to a higher speed limit. Um, the other thing that the rest in red does is it gives us the opportunity to immediately change to whichever phase we want to do next. Um, so pulling those two features together and adding the twist, and the twist is using these advanced radar or other advanced detection techniques. Um, as you can see, conceptually drawn in the, the image above, uh, new equipment will be installed on the mast arm that will be forward looking, uh, looking for approaching vehicles. Uh, that's approximately, you know, three to 400 feet. Paul, Paul yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, you got to, I don't, you're not sharing the slideshow currently. You got to share your screen. I thought I saw the blue highlight. Why is it not? Double click. There you go. Now we're starting. Now we're seeing okay. it, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. It, it shows me a blue box around it and I thought we were good to go. So you are seeing the image with the vehicles and the signal at the moment? We got it. Okay. Um, great. I apologize for that. Uh, but now you can see my conceptual image and the equipment stalled on the mast arm, um, trying to get that vehicle on its approach. Um, the other thing that happens when we ha do have this uh, technology on the mast arm, and the processing speed that's available to us these days is that radar can then uh, make a decision for us. Uh, we will put in a criteria into the controller and it will determine whether it requests that movement for the oncoming traffic or in a case where uh, the criteria is not met, i.e. the vehicle is traveling above the criteria speed, um, it will be ignored basically on the approach. So um, in just kind of reiterating a couple things need to happen. One, the, the signal needs to be in a position where it doesn't have anything to do next. Um, and then two, and that will be when it's resting in red, and two, on lead or on coal, um, the vehicle is approaching and on its advance, the speed will be determined and the criteria will be met or rejected and then it'll be able to switch fairly quickly to a um, qualified vehicle. And that vehicle will be able to go through the traffic signal. Again, if the speed is less than the criteria. Um, you hear me keep saying criteria. Um, one of the things that we're going to do in the implementation process is truly determine what is the threshold for that. There is some variability and in the radar detection, um, it's a pretty good um, technology. Mm -hmm. However, there may be some one or two mile per hour error that we've seen in other cases. So we really wanna to try to nail that down to get the, the best criteria um, for evaluating that. Um, again, a different scenario, when that vehicle is detected on the approach and the speed is greater than um, the posted speed or the criteria that eventually gets set. Um, no call will be placed in advance. The vehicle will see the red all the way up until it re reaches the stop bar. And at that point, the, um, the call will be placed on the controller and they'll be able to proceed. So in this case, if you're compliance, you should be able to continue to be in compliance. And if you're not compliant, uh, the red indication will um, slow you down. Um, one of the questions we received um, had to deal with, you know, can, you know, basically can somebody learn that it's um, not, um, or that it's trying to, um, is somebody going to be able to game the system? And I'm not saying that, that folks um, may not be able to at some point, but just because you have the red indication doesn't mean that it's, it's waiting on you to slow down. Uh, the red indication could also mean vehicles are proceeding from the other direction as it as it always does. And so there is that uh, that case that, that the red should be respected. So as part of our literature research, we went through um, several studies. Um, the rest in red's been around uh, quite a while, um, not uh, something that's been thoroughly 
studied and documented in, in a, many papers, um, but we did find some of those. Uh, the most recent one we found was an uh, application in California, and they put in the rest in red with speed uh, operations. And it was successful. They didn't write a research report or anything. It was a it was a small um, city, and they they liked the results, and they just did it. They did it at one isolated intersection, and not a series of intersections like we would be pursuing here. Um, so again, the the twist with the speed um, criteria is kind of a new operation for for the rest in red technique. Uh, as we talked about, and uh, Councillor Davis hit on the, the studies that have been going on, these are a few of the attempts that have been um, led through the traffic engineering department. Um, one of them was, you know, identified a problem in 2018, the, the speeds were increasing, um, they co coordinated the signal timing and put out the speed signs, uh, as, as in discussed. In 2019, we looked at it again, the speeds were um, still an issue. Um, the signing did not um, seem to have the results um, that we were looking for. So they reduced that maximum green time. Again, if you recall my uh, concept, conceptual description of the rest in red, uh, many times uh, on a coordinated corridor, the signal hangs out on the main street. And in this case, that can, you know, can maybe give that, that false impression that it's, it's go time or it's, you know, the folks are exceeding the speed limit. And so um, the attempt there in the white was to reduce that green time available down to um, the, the amount of time needed to process the vehicles. Um, and then this study in January 21, uh, we went out and looked at additional, uh, observed the speeds and then um, completed the, the rest in red. So a few, uh, at least traffic engineering based uh, studies along the corridor. As part of that, and as part of our study, we went back and looked at some of the speeds throughout those, um, those studies. Um, you can see here that um, the speed profiles, uh, many of the, the count locations were done in different locations for different reasons. So we don't have data for every year in every location. But uh, you can see, in the, especially in the bottom right, um, in 2021, we had some um, exceeding the speed limit uh, by nearly 10 miles per hour on the 85th percentile. And uh, throughout the rest of the corridor, there seemed to be um, significant speeding um, still being observed. So stepping into this study, um, the first thing we did was complete an existing signal infrastructure field inventory. Um, basically, the question is, what would it take at each intersection to deploy um, this system? So we looked at the controller, uh, the vehicle detection systems that were available uh, existing, the preemption devices, and the communication systems. Uh, the required systems for the rest in red uh, basically, you need that Main Street advanced detection system to look out on the approach and be able to measure that speed. You need the Main Street stop line detection system that can detect um, cars that either were ignored by the, the Main Street or say a vehicle turns out of a driveway, um, you know, within that short distance to the intersection and arrives at the intersection. We need to make sure that we capture um, those folks as well. It needs a modern controller cabinet and a modern controller uh, to make these decisions. And it needs preemption, um, which is the optical detectors. Um, the receipt mentioned preemption a few times throughout the presentation. Uh, what we do not want to do is inhibit the, our emergency services. And so we want to make sure that the preemption is operational, that they can get their advanced um, green when needed for emergency services. So with the cost estimate, we were able to look at each of the intersections in our um, on the assigned corridor um, from Broadway to uh, Washington, basically on both lead and coal. Uh, signalized intersections again to make this, this work. And we were able to cost out uh, the, um, what would it take to get the rest in red deployed on these intersections? And you can see those here. Some of those, um, 
There's a baseline cost, which is the advanced detection. Some of them did need a controller upgrade or in case of Broadway, it needed a whole new cabinet, um, which increased the cost. Uh, some of them needed preemption and some of them didn't. So that's really the variability in the cost. Um, so as we talk about costs of the whole project, um, so I will talk about which intersections are, uh, are recommended, but following and should we proceed, uh, there will be um, a design component and then a construction component. Um, at a minimum, those are gonna be six months. Um, as everyone knows these days, the uh, being able to procure equipment uh, these days can be challenging. So we we'll, we'll wanna re just reevaluate that timeline as we get closer to make sure the equipment's readily available and we can, we can meet these uh, estimates. For this project, we did a pretty intensive data collection, uh, both on lead and coal. We used pneumatic two counts. These are the, the rubber tubes you see uh, draped across the road. Uh, we had those out there for at least 48 hours um, in January and then some again in February. Uh, we also used uh, some of the closed circuit, circuit TV um, signal systems equipment throughout the corridor to take some observation counts uh, to help some of our analysis uh, for the site streets. Additionally, we looked at the crash rates for the corridor. Here's the top eight um, throughout the corridor. Each of the, the um, intersections we evaluated were given a ranking. Um, these are, are pretty much, uh, you can see Cole and Yale are pretty much twice the average that we would expect. Um, so definitely seeing higher um, than desired crash rates. Um, uh, desired is, is a, that's the wrong term because we desire zero. Um, but in this case, above average uh, rates for the corridor. So with that, we took those costs you see here. We took the speed inventory, we ranked it. We took the crash uh, history and the, the, the um, rates that you just saw. And we came up with this um, rest in red ranking uh, based on those evaluations. Um, outlined here again is basically if we look at the $300,000 range um, and, and kind of try to pick that out, um, we are looking at these six intersections. Um, based on procurement and uh, uh, feasibility, um, we may be able to do um, a little bit more, but again, it's a little early to to make that final call on, on these. But with that, that concludes the um, summary of the study and I'll turn it back to Councillor Davis uh, and Sean to solicit questions. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. And I think it's important for people to understand sort of how these, uh, these lights work, important to understand that um, you know they provide emergency access, but remember that this is not a solution for, um, every, every, this is not a replacement for policing, but it does provide um, an alternative and a technology-based solution for when an officer is not present um, to intervene in an unsafe situation. Um, and before this meeting started, we asked folks in the community to submit uh, their questions ahead of time so that we could ask the engineers and all the smart folks to, uh, to put their heads together to come up with some of those. Uh, Sean, I think you have the list of the pre-submitted questions. Is that right? And if so, I'm gonna let you sort of moderate this session. Yeah. And uh, we'll try to address as many of those as we can. And then we'll take uh, any additional questions from the public if we still have time. And we're also answering some questions that have been coming into the Q&A. People are free to check out the Q&A button there and see the answered questions already. And some that we might be answering live. We're seeing who best can answer those questions. Um, so I'm gonna go through this um, first, starting with um, some questions that were more specific to this uh, project. So um, these are all gonna be for Lee Engineering. Um, so first, the uh, first question was, you know, what are the overall goals of the program and how will they be evaluated um, subsequent to the, pro to the, once this is actually in place? So uh, the goal of the program is to um, increase the safety on the corridor. Uh, and it's going to do that through um, the speed mitigation. 
And so uh, we've seen, and as, as Councillor Davis uh, indicated, that there is a correlation between uh, increased speeds and uh, crash frequency and crash rates. And so by being able to um, use this system to you know, identify those few outliers that are maybe leading the pack and um, you know, exceeding the speed limit, we'll be able to mitigate a few of those as they go down the road. Again, it won't get everybody and it's not handing out tickets or anything like that. It is the goal is to um, kind of have the corridor kind of manage itself when, uh, again, when enforcement's not available. All right. Um, great. Um, next question we had was, how will the target intersections be selected or how did you select the target intersections since you did already went over the prioritization? Yeah, again, just real quickly, um, we looked at the, the cost that what it would take to implement this for each one of the intersections. We looked at the crash rates um, that were, have been experienced uh, for the last several years. And then we also looked at the speeds that we collected and, and ranked those and uh, made those recommendations. Right. And then from the, I know from our side, you know, we're looking at how to best utilize the funds that we have available to um, hit the most crucial um, crucial intersections. And then as well as looking at bringing additional funds to the table, as well as Councillor Benton is working to bring funds to the table for District 2. I know the Walter intersection has already had funds that were already attributed to it. So, um, so we have City Council paid for the, the study. We had the 300,000 from the legislature from Senator Cia Lopez and from Representative Chasey, um, who, uh, so that should get us a big chunk of the most important intersections. And then if we need additional intersections, we can, we'll be finding additional funds for that. Um, uh, third question, which was also already asked in the chat, but I think other people might be interested in hearing a little about this too, is how does this impact the North South Street? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so north south, um, there's there's two fold of that. One, um, these intersections, whichever ones get selected, uh, will no longer during the rest and red operations be coordinated. Um, so um, there may be uh, some instances where you do get stopped at both going north and south. Um, that said, when it is in rest and red. Um, it is listening for either direction, north, south, or um, lead and coal. And the first come, first served, and it's ready to serve that, that movement. Um, so it is, on the other hand, it is very likely that uh, when you do drive up to um, these intersections from the north or the south, the signal be, may be ready for you and will um, turn promptly. Great. Um, in the report, it was mentioned that there could be a grace speed of five to 10 miles per hour for the, for the signals to activate. So if someone was going a little bit over the speed limit, they might still get a green. Um, could you just speak to that a little bit more to why that might be necessary? You mentioned it in the, in the, your presentation, but. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things like with the, uh, with, we are going to fine tune that within the implementation. That's the, the real answer. The, the five to 10 miles per hour was uh, determined by a couple of things. One, we all know that the, the red light camera and the speed cameras, they do have a five mile an hour buffer. So I was one thinking about how do we kind of align and make sure everybody has the right expectations. And then two, uh, making sure that I have determined the accuracy of the equipment before um, I do that. If there is a variability in the speeds um, that are received by the equipment, versus say uh, going out there with a, a radar gun or having uh, enforcement um, double check us with that, um, then we'd wanna make sure that that uh, variability is accounted for within the, the settings. That's really all that was geared towards. Okay. Um, and let's see. And then, so you said you, the, can you just say again the the boundaries of which you looked at and what's what factors you looked at on the road? Correct. The boundaries uh, was from uh, Broadway, Lenin Coal corridors from Broadway to uh, Washington. Washington not technically being included, um, so I guess Buena Vista um, or uh, 
Let's see. Uh, there is, we received a couple of questions as well as in the chat on just the um, lack of reports and data that are out there on lead and coal. Um, you mentioned this is a pretty novel approach to, to use it. I'm sorry, not lead and coal on the rest and red. Um, this, we, you mentioned this is a pretty novel approach, but uh, could you just speak a little more to the fact of why, what has changed in conditions that's allowed us to do this and why this is kind of a, a new thing that we're able to do that hasn't, and what, why there's not information out there. Right. Um, so um, as I indicated, the, uh, the rest in red has been around for a while. Um, the original intent was for say an isolated intersection, um, maybe out on the West Mesa, the furthest one like Rainbow. Um, and basically it has nothing else going on around it but it is needed. And so what they would do is put it into rest in red. So there's not a preferred movement, but it would be in red and therefore it, it would be ready to serve the first come first serve or the next, next arrival. Um, and kind of adding a little bit to that, the, the reason you rest in red is that if you are servicing one direction and you're ready to change to another direction, you do have to serve the yellow and the all red and that can be uh, four to five, six seconds sometimes before you're able to um, acknowledge the request for the opposing direction. When you've already gone through your yellow and you're all red and now you're resting in red, you don't need to basically make a transition anymore. You can just go to service as that. So the original intent for a rest in red was, was more geared towards these, these rural intersections and nobody's really doing reports or white papers on how to operate a rural intersection and save delay. So that's one reason there's not a whole lot of um, reporting out there. Um, the, this application is basically come around within the past um, oh, several years. Um, we've been using these advanced radar detectors to help uh, um, implement signal timing on many corridors. Uh, some of the first applications of these were looking in advance, say on a downhill, and there'd be heavy vehicles. You could identify a heavy vehicle on the downhill and you would add a little bit more uh, red time if you didn't think that that heavy vehicle was gonna be able to stop by the, by the intersection. So we've really been able to use this advanced radar to add safety um, to uh, many of the intersections. Um, so building on that, uh, not only did they um, look for presence out, uh, meaning detection out there several hundred feet in front of the intersections, they were able to start recording speed. And now that we have the detection out there, we have the speed out there, uh, the processors that are in this equipment have also been able to incorporate logic. And at that point, um, we've got the three pieces basically that we need to make a, a decision on whether we want to accept that call and proceed with changing the signal timing. Or in this case, we'll just wait and let the, the vehicle uh, request that at the stop bar. Great. Um, hey, Julian, can you let Tim Brown into the panelists, please? Um, one uh, concern we got a few times is that in, uh, the report in the speed tube studies that was speed, there were some people traveling, it said at 141 miles an hour at maximum and a few people traveling over a hundred. Um, was this something that you think was accurate or was that just a, some kind of anomaly? Uh, basically that's an anomaly and we see it fairly often. Um, in, in some cases we do truncate the data and describe that anomalies are turned out. In this case, um, we just left it in there so that the data is untouched. Um, but what happens is you have a, a set of two pneumatic tubes going across the roadway and it's going across two lanes. Uh, when vehicles are traveling independently, it does a really good job of looking at the timestamps and the, um, the distances between the axles and determining that is a pickup truck and it is going at, you know, 35 miles an hour. Um, what happens when two vehicles basically like try to simultaneously go over the, 
the tubes at the same time, you know, side by side, those impulses are much harder for it to determine. And in some cases, it's, it just gets thrown into a, a, a high speed bucket. I do not have any indication that anybody's doing 141 miles an hour uh, on the quarter. All right. Then from the chat, we have a few more questions that we hadn't gotten previously. Um, are, how are pedestrians and bicycles accommodated by the signals in either direction? So there'll be um, no change to the existing. Um, the, uh, the stop bar detection that we'll be installing uh, will be ensured that it is uh, detecting bicycles in that case. Um, so stepping back. In the existing coordinated plan, the, uh, there is no detection on the main street and the, v, the signal always rests on the main street in green. So if you're a cyclist on that um, corridor, then you would, um, you would not be detected, but the signal would always come back to you uh, to make sure that you had that movement. Um, now that we are not doing um, a rest in green in, in, in this operation, then um, the stop bar detection is, is one of the criteria is that it is able to detect uh, bicycles and as well as the vehicles. And so it would be given that uh, detection. Uh, same would go for the, the, the side streets. Great. Um, and then again, from the, the chat, um, we had a concern about, you know, with such a sophisticated system, do how what's the confidence that it would actually work regularly and not fail? Yeah, great, great question. I, I know that uh, the signal systems may not have always had the, the best history, um, but in, in this case and in, in our implement, implementations throughout the city of Albuquerque um, lately, the uh, signal systems have been performing fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, controllers have a 25 to 35 year life, same with the, the cabinets and, and that side. The other thing that's happening with this project was probably not as, as um, it is not the focus of the project, but these signals will be put on the city's, um, this, this city's automated traffic signal performance measures system, and it will allow the, uh, the city to better monitor uh, some of those functions as well. All right. We do have a question about what you think this uh, safe speed limit would be for this section. I don't know that you're in a place to answer that, but if you if you want to answer that, I will. I want to acknowledge the question and give you a chance. As an engineer, I don't know if you're comfortable with that, but I will give you the opportunity um, to answer that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna not do that one. Um, I've seen, you know roadways work at this level and roadways that don't. Um, obviously that uh, this, this corridor is experiencing uh, higher than average crash rates and we need to take some, um, some measures. Um, one of the things we may be fighting is the public perception that this corridor is a fast moving corridor and we may need to be uh, a little bit over um, or more aggressive on the safety side. So um, I think each corridor is unique um, but this one definitely uh, illustrates that it does need additional attention. All right. I'm going to shift gears a little bit from the questions that are in the chat and ask some more that were submitted ahead of time so we can make sure we get through them. Um, this one could either be for Lee or from, uh, for Tim Brown. Uh, does, do either of you have a good feel for how art has affected the corridor, uh, whether it's increased uh, the load on, on uh, lighting coal as a result? of limiting traffic on central i can so, uh, i can good. dive into that a little bit paul and and maybe if if you have some uh something to add on the back end so i have been looking at the regional counts kind of uh you know going all the way back to 2009 volumes on the corridor fluctuate a lot um there was a point prior to the road diet where it was carrying a lot of traffic, it dropped some after the uh, lanes were reduced to, uh, to two lanes. It went up during art construction and it seems to have gone back down, but I wanna caution everybody and say that volumes as a whole dropped as a result of COVID 
And so it's really difficult to tell if they're kind of returning to what they were pre-art or whether that was a temporary drop as a result of COVID. And to be honest, we're probably really not gonna know the answer to that for another couple of years, unfortunately. Okay, Paul, did yeah, you have anything to add or? Not really, I'd reiterate what, what Tim said. I don't have the, haven't looked at the data that far back, but uh, my comment was gonna be at this point with the data that I do have, uh, COVID's gonna be in the mix and, and really don't have a, a direction on where the volumes of the corridor are going. Okay. Um, I want to circle back around to some questions on um, uh, on APD and enforcement questions. Um, we don't have enough from APD on the on the call, but Council Davis, I think, is well equipped to answer these questions. I'm kind of just going to group these together so we can um, keep moving because we have about 15 minutes left here. So some of the questions we got is: Will there be enforcement and fines and penalties for violators? Now, why is APD not doing more enforcement or, or often echo just like, why can't we do more enforcement on that and call that would be the most effective thing? Um, why are we not addressing loud mufflers and music? And will um, speed cameras or some kind of red light cameras be, be put forward in on letting call? Let, let me take a stab at a couple of those really quickly, Sean, just to answer a couple of those. And I know we can go to other questions. Um, so some of you know, and some of you helped us um, earlier this year when uh, the city council pressed APD to come up with a plan to address the loud mufflers, uh, motorcycle racing, which those of us who, who live near Gibson and Monta Vista and Lomas um, hear relentlessly sometimes, particularly on the weekends. Um, and I, we should give credit to APD uh, to say that they did do that. Uh, they created a tactical plan. They spent a couple of weeks uh, working uh, to target those vehicles and issued more than 100 citations for improper vehicles. Um, but those officers were put back onto other priorities after the, the funding for that program ran out. Um, and that's been a real challenge for us, right? Even though APD has more than, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if somebody knows better, but last report we saw, uh, was almost 30 officers assigned to the traffic unit and they wrote more than 100 tickets one day last week when we had another presentation at the city council. Um, but that's citywide for officers that are dedicated just to traffic and we until we get a place where we have enough officers to manage the calls for service, where you're not waiting when you call 911 traffic proactive traffic enforcement um, remains a lower priority for APD. That said, uh, that's one reason that we think that technology is a better solution here. Um, I'm not a proponent of the speed vans because I don't think, and as I said, in the you, some of you saw in the paper and in the news, um, sending somebody a ticket in the mail three weeks later doesn't stop them from speeding down lead and coal right now or five minutes from now. Um, you have to have an intervention. And if you don't have a police officer to interrupt that activity, um, some of these technology answers will do that. They will create the red light if you're speeding. Um, and uh, it changes your behavior to, in order to learn how to do that. Um, but more importantly, it also doesn't spend you, it uh, doesn't find someone um, and create problems for low income people who are already having challenge with their uh, economic status and their credit and housing and the ways that impacts everybody else. Um, so the mayor has proposed bringing back speed vans, um, but there's no promise on well there, where they will be used. Um, and at the moment, that is still before the city council. Um, the details are not worked out right now. It's policing for profit, and it's going to be run by a private company that gets paid per ticket. Um, and so we're trying to work through those details. Uh, but I think we should look at some of these other options. And I think we have an opportunity because we've proven with doing the studies and doing the data that, that traffic on lead and coal is an issue. It's not just a, a thing that neighbors talk about on next door. There's real data to show us that there's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and absent a police officer, we're looking for some of those other options. Um, and so we'll continue to press APD to do those specialty plans, but um, they can't be everywhere all the time. Um, and right now they're faced with choosing to go to a, a, a serious violent call or do proactive traffic enforcement. Um, and that's not a choice we like them having. So we're trying to address where we are now until we build to where we wanna be in the future. So. Uh, not the best answer, I'll be the first to tell you. And, and credit why you see our city council meetings now take four hours long to talk about policing issues. Uh, let's see, Sean, do we have other questions that we wanna to go to from the public or from the Q&A? Um, 
Uh, I'm gonna get one to one more question that's was pre-submitted. Well, two more questions are pre-submitted, and then we're gonna get back to the over the Q and A. Um, so the uh, previously the the lead and coal state brigade worked for the mayor's office. Tim, this one's gonna be for you on some suggestions. Um, there were some some suggestions that were made. They've some folks wanted to know where if they were followed up on or if they're being pursued. So I'm gonna uh, list them off kind of quickly and Tim, you could take them as you can, please. Um, so they were curious about uh, whether the, the city had create, uh, completed the road safety audit from the FHWA, uh, whether they they had considered reducing the speed to 25 miles an hour and whether they had considered including the rumble strips, raised pavement markers, tubular markers, Chevron signs, et cetera. So I'll, I'll try and take those more or less in order. Uh, the road safety audit uh, was actually uh, tabled for lead and coal and uh, a road with a higher identified pedestrian uh, crash rate and, and motor vehicle crash rate was selected for, uh, for that effort. Um, regarding the uh, reduction of speed to 25, this is, uh, of course, a discussion that, that we went back and forth with uh, many times with the, the lead and coal task force. The fundamental issue is that lead and coal serve as regional facilities. And uh, it was decided that as functioning regional facilities, 30 miles an hour was a more appropriate speed limit. We were trying uh, other methods to reduce crashes on the corridor. Uh, which is basically how we have arrived at leveraging the current infrastructure that's out there to uh, um, to reduce crashes rather than trying to introduce a speed limit. We did our very best, I feel like, to get people to understand that the speed limit is in fact 30 miles an hour and we wanted people to go 30 miles an hour and unfortunately our efforts in that regard have uh, not been successful. So uh, I would argue that reducing the speed limit further is also not going to be successful. People want to drive how they want to drive on that corridor. And I don't believe uh, reducing the speed limit to 25 would, would really have a significant effect. As a result, we're where we are today, where we're looking at modifying the traffic signal operation in order to really force people to go a speed that, based on the data, they don't really want to go. Um, and... Uh, uh, like I say, we have we have made some efforts. The other thing uh, that was mentioned, some of the tubular markers, the raised pavement markers, uh, that kind of thing. Um, as a rule, those are not particularly effective at slowing people down. Um, I've tried those uh, in other jobs and in, in other cities before and after data. Um, they work in certain circumstances, but uh, I'm not convinced that they would be particularly effective in this context, um, I will say that uh, we had looked at a number of other countermeasures based on the specific crash types. So looking at uh, reducing the likelihood of uh, runway crashes or trying to reduce the likelihood of someone running a stop sign, we had kind of generally planned to use uh, the state capital outlay that uh, Councilor Davis was able to acquire to uh, explore some of those options. And uh, ultimately we decided that the, the best use of those funds would be to modify the, the signal operation as, as we're talking about today. So um, a, lot of, a lot of different things in there. We have put a lot of thought into all of this, um, but, uh, uh, and we ultimately decided that this solution is what we believe to be our best option. Right. Um, then coming back to, to Paul, uh, we told Paul we got some last minute questions that came in. Um, I'm going to, there's three questions I'm going to consolidate into one. Um, there were some current concerns that came out early on. I believe it was on the Knob Hill list serve um, that uh, someone who was an engineer um, was saying that these types of lights are not appropriate, are only appropriate on single lane roads and not recommended for streets with high volumes. They're also not appropriate for um, for long timed corridors. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that at all. Um, yeah, I'll save it there. Yeah, yeah. And I, I did get the 
the, the background on that. So appreciate that. Um, definitely some, there's some valid concerns in here. Um, so let's, uh, let's unpack that for a minute. Um, so the coordination piece, I mean, obviously we just talked about this being a regional corridor. It does need to move some track volumes into peak hours. Um, so one of the things that's gonna happen in the implement, implementation uh, piece is that we're not just gonna flip the switch, turn it on and see what happens. Um, so one of the things is we, we're gonna use a systems engineering approach. As we, we check the settings in the controller, we check the detection, we check the speed compliance, and then we'll implement it in stages as we go through throughout the process. Uh, you know, definitely nailing it down at one or two intersections and then starting to expand it. Similarly, we were going to nail it down at uh, you know, some off-peak times. Let's make sure it's working and functioning correctly. And then we were going to expand that. It is possible, uh, while our preliminary analysis did say that this can work during the coordinated period, but I, I will, you know hold that it is possible that um, it could disrupt some traffic flow. Um, so, you know, at that point, we may choose to dial it back and maybe the AM peak uh, hour, AM peak 30 minutes, a PM peak hour does continue to operate in a coordinated fashion. And the other times of the day when actually there's more room and more potential for speeding because they're not being limited by the volume of the corridor, um, we may be running it in a, a more effective rest in red period. So um, that kind of you know addresses that. Um, is this a solution for Coors? No, I it, it, absolutely, I, I get it. Um, I did want to be clear about one thing while I do have the um, piece is that when we are determining the speed of the approaching vehicle, um, we this system will not shut down the green light. So it is only capturing that first vehicle because it has to be in the rest and red in order for the system to make that decision. So if it's already green because folks are going through the signal and a speeder is identified in the middle of the pack, that speeder is just going to be part of the system. Uh, we're not going to be able to um, you know, penalize all the other vehicles for that one violation. Um, that would be more of an enforcement uh, opportunity um, in that case. Um, going back to the questions, um, the, the single lane, uh, you know, two vehicles side by side, one is speeding, one is not. Um, whichever one the radar picks, it's going to make that decision and, and that will be part of the process uh, when that happens. Uh, same thing, and I, coordination is really goes back to the, the same question about the high volumes. Um, so we will be looking at that throughout the implementation period and making sure we're picking the right times of day to operate that. Again, we did look at it. We ran a, a model. There's not a, a traffic simulation model with a, a rest in red button. So we did our best to emulate the operations um, and make sure that uh, it was a feasible um, approach. Piggybacking off that, uh, do you think that the radar detection would work with speeds at like 60 miles an hour or greater if someone was to go there? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are we are using it, uh, some of the similar technology on Coors um, that you do use them on the freeways and, and those types of situations. So that it is well within the range of um, its determination to do that. Okay. Um, so we have just a few more questions that are that are currently in the chat, um, and I'm uh, sorry, just trying to catch up and read them at the same time. Um, so, uh, with the extreme data points, the 100 miles per hour and 141 mile an hour, are they removed from the analysis or kept in? Um, I would have to go back and check. I believe we did. Uh, kick those out. Um, it wouldn't really particularly uh, matter for the prioritization since the prioritization was more based on the accidents. Is that correct? Yeah, they, it, was, it was equally proportioned based on the cost, the crashes, and, and the speed. Um, but we can, we can definitely look at that. Okay. Um, then uh, for, there's a question regarding platoon trap patterns saying traffic mostly follows and flows in platoons. So um, 
does that, based on what you just said about a speeder at the end of the pack, suggest this implementation implementation would be more challenging? Um, yeah. Yeah. So if there there are speeders at the end of the pack. They are um, not going to be. Um, one of the candidates for the criteria. Um, basically what the, the engineering system for that is they would then join the pack and then they would be, their speed would be uh, mitigated by the friction of the, the, the folks that are doing the, the, the speed limit. If the whole pack is speeding, uh, the, you know, when they get to the next rest in red signal, uh, they would not get the green indication and be, um, served again when it's their time. Great, and then um, Tim, if you don't mind, uh, Tim, you mentioned lead coal is a regional facility. What is the best available data on who uses lead and coal from where to get where? Um, and then can you just speak a little bit more about the, the appropriateness of the, the speed on lead and coal? The comparison was Rio Grande and Los Ranchos. Uh, so, um... I guess there's there's kind of two questions there. Uh, generally, the I would I would guess, but I have not looked at the the regional travel demand model. I would guess that uh, the majority of the traffic is coming from uh, points east in the city, and uh, uh, and heading to downtown in the morning, and then coming from downtown and and heading to points east in the evening. Uh, basically commuter traffic uh, from the residences uh, in the southeast corner of the city to uh, the, the major job centers, UNM and, uh, and downtown. Um, as far as, uh, you know, regarding the speed limit, comparing to the speed limit that another jurisdiction picked for their road, I guess I can't really uh, comment on that. Um, it may be that uh, uh, that agency did a thorough engineering study and determined that 25 miles an hour was the appropriate speed for their corridor. Um, but I, I really couldn't compare why one agency makes a decision and, and why the city of Albuquerque makes another. Uh, 30 miles an hour has been the speed limit historically for lead and coal. Um, and uh, I have not really seen any studies to this point that would indicate that 25 miles an hour is better because it's on Rio Grande uh, in, in another agency. All right, um, we are coming up on our hour here. So um, I see we still have a few more questions. So I would ask that if anyone has additional questions, uh, they can enter into the chat and we will get back with answers to those questions. Um, so we'll give it a, a few minutes there um, for people to enter that. I'm uh, digging through my notes to, to answer um, JA's question about the cost of the study. Um, and then besides that, yeah, if everyone were to put in any additional questions or just additional thoughts that they might have that they want to um, add to put in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, we will be doing, this meeting will be, uh, is being recorded and will be posted online. Um, we'll also have some follow-up. So like I said, if you did not register for the meeting, please send me an email um, so I can uh, make sure that you are included on the list for any additional follow-up. Um, and then for that, I will kick it over to Councillor Davis to uh, start to wrap it up, unless any of the panelists have anything they want to add before we uh, start to wrap. Thanks, Sean. I want to give our legislators a chance to weigh in as well. And thank you to Paul and your team and Jonathan, uh, and again, to Tom and Tim. Uh, for all of us who live in this neighborhood and drive these streets every day, we know that this is a problem. But for five years, we've struggled to get real data that we could use to prove, what, to prove that we have a problem. Um, and we've heard before promises about traffic studies and other things. And as Tim mentioned, they got re prioritized and moved by other pieces of the city. Um, to other priorities. And I appreciate everybody. I know Joseph, you and uh, the Gary and, uh, and some of the team uh, from these two neighborhoods have worked with us for years to continue to talk about this, to continue to press this um, and to get real data we could use to show there's a problem. And now that we know there's a problem, um, we're looking for some alternatives and some creative solutions. Um, I, Paul, I really appreciate your team. I know y'all got back 
to the drawing board a couple of times on these to be sure that we really got the right data and figure out what intersections these work in. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can't do it without folks like our Senator City of Lopez and uh, Representative Chasey. Um, these amazing women stepped up uh, with all the big things they have to do all around the state. They stepped up to help me and, and you all take care of a neighborhood issue. Um, and that's how we work together. So um, I'd love to see us do this in other parts of the city, uh, but we have enough funds to get started uh, with a few priority intersections to prove that this works. This works. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, that uh, even though we do have delays in getting equipment, those of you who've been waiting on the crosswalk on Central in front of Flying Star and Senator, you helped us get capital outlay for that two years ago. Uh, it's on order, it's been engineered. You can see the cuts in the, uh, the street. We all know it's coming, uh, but all those are delayed by those uh, um, uh, supply chain problems. So we're waiting on those, but we know that's happening and we're not waiting to do that one to start the next one. So I appreciate that. Uh, Senator, uh, and, and again, if everyone will, please use the Q&A to give us your input. We're going to take public comment on this through Q&A. So before we make a final decision about deploying these, uh, we're, we're using real input. So Senator, I'll start with you. If you have any closing comments, we'll go to Representative Chasey and then uh, we'll let folks weigh in in the Q&A um, and then move forward on next steps. Well, thank you. I thought that was really helpful and um, you answered a lot of questions and, and that was great. Um, I, I just want to share with you, uh, Councillor Davis and, and the rest of the, the team, that this is a priority for me. So that if you, and this session, we're likely to have a lot of capital outlay. Um, so if there are other intersections you want or other measures that can be taken to enhance safety in this area, please let me know, you always, you always do. Uh, but please work closely with me and um, we'll get this done. Gail, uh, are you still with us? Oh yeah, hi. Yes, <clears throat> yes. and for some reason I could not figure out how to enter my questions in the q and I put them in the chat. So uh, it's like every time I have a technology question, I need one of my sons here and neither of them lives in Albuquerque. So sorry about that. Um, I, I was, I was concerned about the timeline because we've been talking about this um, and the neighbors have been living it and we've been talking about this for, for years, literally. And we've got six months and then six months, I think, to look at before it's implemented. And um, <clears throat> I do think it's wise not to put them everywhere. Let's see how it works before you spend the money. But um, I had spoken with the mayor about the speed vans and I hear you. Councillor Davis about what your concerns are, but I, I drive in Santa Fe and they have them there in a number of neighborhoods and uh, <clears throat> people are very cautious when they see them. I, I, watch, I watch them do it. So I, I would think that um, perhaps we could look at that as a temporary solution to try to calm it down sooner so I, I hate to rule that out entirely. I, I do hear you, um, but I, I think that there are um, there's some parts of the state using them successfully. So um, anyway, and, and as, as Senator Cedillo Lopez said, I, I don't think there's any higher priority for our neighborhood than this. And we, um, we should be able to help quite a bit this coming session, so. I hope so. Certainly the state's funding looks good and we hope that if we can show this works pretty quickly, we could have a, something that we can share with the rest of the city and expand and thank you. And, and Representative, you're absolutely right. I was pressing to get this done this summer, um, but everything in government takes longer than it should. It took us four years to get data um, in order to show that we have a problem, but we are working on it and, I, and I'm going to keep pressing on it um, and I appreciate this. So absent some mm -hmm. uh, some new factor that folks throw in the Q&A tonight that really uh, is something we haven't thought about and our engineers don't feel like has been addressed. Uh, I'm gonna press to do this as quickly as we can. I'd love to see this done before the end of the year. Um, I don't know how, that, that's ambitious for government work, but that's gonna be um, us to press because we wanna bring this to you at the session and say, hey, look, it is starting to work. Let's see what we can do to expand. Um, and so thank you very much. I, I agree. And, and when it comes to speed vans and we got a few of those questions, um, I. I, I'm not a fan, uh, but I know that folks are and they're looking for a solution. And so I appreciate my colleagues at the council who uh, who agreed to uh, 
support some tepidly uh, an amendment that would allow people unable or unwilling to pay to do community service, for example, sure. in lieu of. And sure. I think that's a good compromise. Sure. Um, and I do think the camera, I think those cameras and those vans are coming back, not the red light cameras. Voters have banned our uh, voted those out, but the cam the vans are probably coming back. And so I'm trying to be sure we do it in an equitable way um, to be sure that we can change behavior as much as we can. And they would be quicker than these. So I appreciate that. Uh, folks, thank you for participating in our Q&A tonight. Um, you can continue to email me or Sean and uh, or if any of our Senator representative get any emails or questions, I know we can all find each other. We do all the time um, and we'll get you an answer back. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to share some next steps. Oh, hey judge. Uh, we'll be able to share some next steps. Uh, oh, he's bringing dinner. How nice. Uh, we'll be able to share some next steps with you all pretty soon. Uh, thank you to the team. Thank you to Tom. Um, and I wanted to introduce Nathan Molina from Councilor Benton's office as well. Thank you, Nate, for being here. And uh, we will see you next time.